Okay. Hi there, David. Um, so thanks Hi, so much Jude. for taking the time today. Uh, it's a real pleasure having you here today. Um, for anyone who doesn't know the connection, um, I, I actually started off uh, going to the Glasgow School of Art uh, on the PDE course, uh, similar to yourself. And then yeah. I think I had kept in touch with uh, various people and ultimately made it out to the company you co-founded, Spec Design in California, for what I, I say with no exaggeration was honestly a, a life-changing internship um, and just, just that, an incredible that's good. <laughs> experience. It really was. Um, it, 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 in many ways, it, it, it teed up in, in the entire approach to my final year project and um, I think laid the foundations to a lot of the values which I still hold very dearly today. So um, through a weird twist of events of one of your uh, recent employees pinging me on YouTube and then I realizing that he worked for you, we find ourselves at this wonderful serendipitous moment of... Uh, having a Zoom call in uh, isolation, so... Yeah, in <laughs> self-isolation so, Zoom call. So, so I'm, I'm definitely uh, taking advantage of the situation of your uh, confinement, but I'd love it if you could just tell people a little bit about your background and uh, where all the story began. Yeah, um, so I went to the PDE program at uh, Glasgow. That was back, uh, I was in the very first year of it, so we were kind of the... The guinea pigs, it turned, I guess, uh, when we graduated, there was four of us in the entire year. So, um, yeah, fantastic course. Kind of, that was the course that changed my life, for sure. Um, and then from there, I uh, got a, a engineering job in a plastic injection molding mm -hmm. uh, in northern England, <laughs> of all places. <laughs> Um, and so I did injection molding for a year and a bit and then actually moved to the States um, and started with uh, a company called IDEO. I was there for three or four years before starting my own consultancy in the Bay Area um, with three other guys. So, um, yeah, I mean, essentially that was back in 96, started uh, SPEC, which is a design consultancy. And the whole goal with that uh, design consultancy was to do our own projects. And so that was part of the, um, I mean, the name was spec, which was speculative, mm -hmm. um, short for speculative. The other thing, uh, so we did a lot of speculative design. So we did about 20% uh, of our time was spent working on non-billing projects. So mm. um, everything, everything and anything, <laughs> we were all over the map. There was no... It was very little strategy around what we worked on for quite a while. Um, and obviously we worked on, on just standard product design stuff for a bunch of different clients. Um, and then probably our biggest hit uh, was when we started a case company, and that was probably 2003. Mm. And we started Spec Products, which uh, is a case manufacturing company that does cases. It did cases for everything at that point, but it, uh, the majority of stuff quickly evolved to around the Apple ecosystem. Um, and uh, that grew to be a pretty big business, um, which uh, I eventually sold off to Samsonite. Mm-hmm. Um, and then started a bunch of companies since then. So kind of went from being a designer and more onto the entrepreneurial side. Yeah. And I think, I think it's actually surprising that, uh, you know, you, it isn't just the only company you sold. You had uh, open talent made. Uh, and, and so it seems like, uh, I can't help but ask, but was it something that you set out to build a company knowing that it would be a perfect opportunity for a particular company to buy? Or is that just the, the energy and the, the nature of the business out there at the time in the Bay Area? Um, as you get older, you realize <laughs> that most companies aren't around for very long. Uh -huh. Like, um, you know, when you're a kid, you have your Kellogg's Corn Flakes and you think, oh, you know, well, one, Kellogg's is a British company. It's not. <laughs> Two <laughs> is that uh, it'll always be there. And Kellogg's is a bad example because it's still around. But, uh, you know, there's just companies come and go all the time. They have such a short shelf life in reality. And they don't necessarily go away. 
they just get purchased, amalgamated, changed. And so, um, yeah, we never really started off. I mean, you never start a company thinking, oh, I'm going to grow this and, and sell it because uh, that's kind of the exact opposite of how you build a great company. Um, you, you, you start it and think, okay, how do I build this so that 100 years from now it's, it's doing amazing stuff? Um, but then the reality of my personality and what I like to do means that I much prefer the early days mm. of kind of creating stuff out of nothing, building something, a brand and the products. And so I kind of have less interest in the, the more mature stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the, um, the scale up. <laughs> yeah. And so when it gets beyond a certain revenue, it just becomes less interesting. And maybe, I don't know if, I mean, that's just been the case. I, I, one of the designer syndromes is you kind of like new shiny objects. <laughs> and so uh, when they line up with the path of the company that you've started, then it's good. And if they don't, then you tend to start another company because you're like, oh, well, I'm really super excited about doing that. And so... Um, well, I think that's what I find quite interesting about your journey is uh, I guess it requires a bit of, uh, let, let's call it what it is, humility and self-awareness to actually say that. Because I think, you know, uh, having worked with different types of startup, there are some founders who... Uh, I guess to your earlier point, some actually do design it hoping that it is going to be acquired by, you know, one of the big four or something like this. But actually a lot of founders, they started as a passion project. They love that phase. And and then it just, it, it for me, it doesn't actually seem a big surprise that the skill set that makes you or indeed any of those people incredible founders, it it's quite different from the person who wants to just maintain the ship on a steady course. And so I always find it quite miraculous when you do have someone who stays the entire distance. Yeah, they're um, they're they're a very rare breed, and yeah. I, you know I take my hat off to them. The Elon Musks and the app, the you know, uh, Steve Jobs of the world, who can kind of transition and grow a, a huge thing. Um, but yes, there's a lot of us who really really enjoy the early phase, mm. and so the later phase is just less fun. So I guess my, although there's money, more money involved. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I guess my interesting question, I hope it's interesting anyway, was that it it wasn't to necessarily say, oh, uh, the Bezos and and Jobs way is the best way. It's that if you're as young as you are, how do you know what is going to be a good fit for you? Are you the long distance person and you should lay a totally different foundation, or are you interested in that earlier phase and you know that you need to be ready to look over the, uh, over the walls I mean, after my, a few years. My initial reaction is you never, ever know. And so right. it's really about uh, doing it and in the doing, learn. And as part of that learning, it's kind of self, self-learning. self Like, what do I, oh, do I actually enjoy this? Do I actually doing like operations? Do I like, you know, the scaling? Do I like, you know, and so... And that, it, there's no way you can predict that. Really, you can't really predict it until you go through that experience mm. of, um, you know, just because all that, you know, the start, there's a few of you, you're doing everything and everything, you're cleaning the toilet, you're building the website, you're like going over to China and trying to ship product. And then, you know, now you start, you start growing and there's more people and things get more structured. And so people start getting titles and you know, there, there's more of a silos. And so yep. is that fun? I mean, it's really, it isn't until you start doing that kind of stuff that you're like, oh, well, I don't quite enjoy what I'm doing so much nowadays. I wish I were doing more of this. And so, I mean, obviously you can, you can steer your path and stay in the same company. And it just so happened that I just really like the starting. Like the, yeah. I think, I think it's the design background. It's that whole blank blank page if you start with a blank page what you know where can you take it and the answer is anywhere Mm. and so that's just such an exciting time and it's such an exciting opportunity that's what I really like is that blank page and so um, there's less opportunity there's well there's always opportunity in the later stages but there's just less it's just such an open playing field when it's early so it's just Mm. for me it's just more fun 
I mean, I mean, if anything, I almost feel that maybe it just occurred to me actually while you were describing those sort of traits and those characteristics that maybe Bezos or even uh, Richard Branson comes to mind of that maybe they're actually not that dissimilar, that they are still obsessed with the shiny new thing. It's that they make businesses which allow them to keep jumping to shiny new things. Because I suspect Bezos hasn't done a lot in the books department, which is where he started. He's busy doing all sorts of other shiny new things. Oh, it's yeah, just, I mean, that's he's a bad example now. just because he's, he's you know, <laughs> such a Superman, super person. Um, yeah, he is, an, he is a bad example because he is starting lots of, lots of kind of things. But mm. uh, you know, he's an example of just playing really, really, really large. Yeah. And so I have never played that large. I mean, for, I, I sometimes ask myself, why am I not interested in playing that large? Because uh, there's always part of you that thinks, oh, I'd love to change the world to such an, as such an impact as someone like that. But again, it's kind of knowing oneself is, um, it takes a lot of hubris. Mm. It takes a lot of being able to deal with money. And so dealing with venture capital and all that whole ecosystem, and I've never really done that. Never really wanted to do that, um, and so that definitely limits more the kind of venture stuff that I end up doing. Because if you don't take other people's money, um, you just have to be smaller. Yeah, you have to take smaller. You have to take smaller. Kind of, you can't really swing for the fence so far, so much. It's uh, much easier to swing for the fence than somebody else's money. Yeah, and I I, th- I think it does it does sort of create a different dynamic in a team. I don't think I'm I'm not making any particular reference to any of the companies I've worked for, but the more money you owe to shareholders who are they're quite often different shareholders to what joined at the beginning of the company when it was when it was quite embryonic and still finding its way. So I think as well, if if you're struggling with the appetite of of those sorts of uh, financial scale. It is sometimes nice to reset, I can imagine, and, and go back to a smaller gig. Well, I mean, it, I, I say this to, you know, people, when people ask, like, you know, how do I start? Where should I go? When I get my soapbox, it's very much like when people think about starting a company, they think about starting Apple. Mm. And they think about starting Tesla. And they think about starting Microsoft. And those are all... Um, lightning striking and hitting <laughs> like a, the nail on the head. You know, it's like there were a million other startups and those are the ones that kind of made it to where they are now. They're just like, yeah. it's, a, it's a billion to one chance or a million to one chance. It's like, and as soon as you, as you look at the statistics around venture capital, you know, they are essentially making big bets on a, on companies and they expect one in 10 to fail. And so mm. there obviously there's this filtration up to the point where we even get venture capital. So there's a whole bunch of people that didn't even get there. And so it's just, it's a very different game. It's, it's purely a game of chance and it's really hard to win. Whereas if you do the small adventures, which I've always done, is it's actually pretty easy and not, and you you know people always say oh well aren't you worried about failing, and the reality is the failure rate for smaller companies is much much less. So when you don't you're mm-hmm. not swinging you're not trying to you know solve world hunger or, or whatever <laughs> you you know if you just want to create a product where there is already an existing product but you're going to do something a little different and hopefully a little better, and you understand the um, economics of that market it's just the likelihood of failure is less. And so, um, and that's always something that startup and, you know, doing an entrepreneurial thing is all about how do you avoid failure at uh, most costs? So, so I guess, is there an interesting dynamic of uh, small enough that you have the autonomy to make the decisions and dare I say it, the control, but then big enough so that the, the whatever you want to call it, the company, the entity can actually affect that change in a market? Because at yeah. the end of the day, you're usually still trying to sell something. And that might need uh, a certain minimum order quantity, to not use too much jargon here, 
But, you know, you can't always just make one-offs. You have to make something at scale that makes sense as a, as a business, even if it's small. So I guess what what lessons have you learned about what is just big enough, should we say, for the goal that you want to achieve? So, so there, we had a company. Uh, so, my, so I started Spec Design with uh, three guys, kind of lost two over the way, still friends with them. Um, and it was myself and then my partner, Ryan, kind of, mm. we were well balanced. Um, um, and so we had a vehicle for a while called Venture Niche or Venture Niche. I don't know how you say it <laughs> now. I'm just really I'm, I'm comfortable with both. <laughs> uh, and so that kind of reflected or reflects how I think about stuff. Like if you want to start something, always, always start in a niche. Mm. And so back to your question of like, how do you know if something's going to be you? You don't. But if you start in a niche, um, there's going to be a bunch of passionate people in that niche or niche that will buy your stuff. Mm. They will give you a huge amount of feedback for free because they're passionate. Uh, there's just many less players in that niche. And so... It's much easier to start in a, in a niche. And then is it going to be huge? Um, it depends on the niche you choose or the niche you choose. But um, I mean, if you think about when drones first showed up, I don't know if you recall that. I do, yeah. Uh, so I was at a trade show in, in the States called CES. It's a pretty huge tr trade show. And I was there because Spec had a booth and, uh, you know, I like to wander around the trade show. So I'll spend a, like a day or two just walking end to end of the trade show, just like head down looking for just things that spark interest. And there were these people flying these drones. I think it was Parrot, one of the very first Parrot drones. Mm. And I thought, what the hell are they doing? <laughs> That's just crazy. No one's going to buy that. I mean, it just seemed like a toy. It was a foam thing with a like a fan in it and it kind of, they could control it, go up and down and up and down. And that was probably the early 2000s. And obviously, you know, drones are everywhere doing everything from trying to transport people as taxis to remote inspections to, you know, drones obviously were a huge thing. And at the time I'm like, oh, like completely like, you know, straight, straight past me. Um, but I, I think about that, it was a complete niche. It was yeah. kind of hobbyist. It was like, oh, this is just so cool. The people that were doing it were just like, they kind of shared like specs and how they did it and the RF and the stuff like this. And so the early phase, you know, everyone was kind of playing together and it was just this, you know, niche around like, I can, this is like, you know, radio controlled planes, but it's, it's cooler, right? And so that's why... I just think a niche is just so much easier to start in. And so that's what I've always tried to start somewhere which feels like the, the big players aren't necessarily there. Mm. Um, and it's something that has a passionate user base and it's just easier to kind of find something. So, you know, you talked to Joe earlier. Yes. And so one of my latest ventures is a gaming headset. And uh, we're launching into gaming and of course, gaming is not a niche, but when you think about it in the context of headsets, it's very much a niche. Mm. And so, and the, probably one of the lead players in that is called Turtle Beach. And Turtle Beach, they don't particularly make great audio, but they make very specific gaming headsets. And so they're, you know, a couple of hundred million dollar company, probably more now. Mm. Um, but not by being a particularly great audio company. They're, they're, they are because they just focus on gaming and they're all about gaming. Um, and so the, you've got all the other audio companies, you know, the Sonys, the Bose, the, you know, the high-end stuff. And it would be much harder to just enter into uh, audio. Like, how, how would I focus what I'm pitching? And so, you know, one of the reasons we started in gaming was because it's just so much easier to kind of identify who the users might be, what they're actually looking for in their headset. So it wasn't just like, oh, it's about the good audio. It's about, okay, well, they need a boom mic. 
they need a wire. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff around that. Um, and un unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, the headset actually works really well for um, the 3D audio that's being built into games mm. these days. And so it actually works better than any other headset. But that was wow. a little bit serendipit serendipitous. I mean, we knew we had a good headset, yeah. but it, um, it allows people to kind of pinpoint kind of the 3D things better than pretty much any other headset. And so uh, we also have a story in, in gaming. So that, that was a little serendipitous. Mm. But it was, you know, starting a niche. But it's it's interesting uh, that you're mentioning about the sort of uh, the, the 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 audience being quite small, even though the, the the scale is 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 very big of the gaming market. And I kind of think, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm I'm no crystal ball uh, sort of specialist in these things, but I do remember something very much at Lego that was impressed of saying, it's it's good to find a niche that might have the potential to get very big, yeah. and so. It would be one thing if you said we're making audio and it's for I don't know bird watchers, and you go yeah. well, there's only so many thousand bird watchers in you know any given country, so it's it's always going to be constrained. Um, whereas there is a titanic amount of gamers, and so then it becomes a question of well, well that isn't your problem. It's probably how do you segment it to access a wider pool of people, and obviously at different price points and all these sorts of things. So. I guess, unless you were to disagree, that that feels like for me one reasonable, should we say, pearl of wisdom for want of a better word. Was there any other things that you felt were a conscious decision of of using a niche to your advantage? Um, well, I like to relate. When we first started my design consultancy in ninety six, uh, we were doing these speculative projects, and our speculative projects were all over the map. Um, one of the big ones was uh, uh, thermal management for laptops. Mm -hmm. And so we created this architecture. Actually, we, uh, while we were working at the design company IDEO, we, had, um, we were doing a lot of la laptop work and thermal management and stuff like that. And so uh, independently, we'd, we'd come up with this kind of laptop architecture, which uh, dealt with a lot of the heat issues that were apparent well, you know, that were happening back then. And so we, you know, left IDEO, we, you know, signed an agreement with those guys, we took the IP, and we spent the next 18 months to two years essentially negotiating with Intel, talking to AMD. Um, and the huge takeaway from that was, like, after 18 months, the, they just said no. Mm. <laughs> Intel just said, no, we're not interested. And so we, you know, poured our heart and soul into this. Uh, but the, the takeaway and the reason I bring it up was mm. it was a huge project. It was a laptop architecture. So in order to build a prototype, you essentially kind of had to build a laptop <laughs> and a laptop architecture from scratch. And that was millions and millions of dollars. And we just, you know, we had no money. <coughs> um, and so we built models. And so essentially it was a, the laptop opened Mm -hmm. And on the back of the display, we put the, the motherboard. And the whole thing translated away slightly as the thing opened. Right. And so, so you could have all your hot chips here. They were spaced away from the screen. They allowed, like, the chimney effect to cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All your um, heat-sensitive stuff, the most heat-sensitive thing in your laptop at that time was your um, CD. Yes. Essentially, your, your optical drive, they, had a, you know, they have a very low heat tolerance. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the um, heating issues were all about taking heat away from there and just, you know, fans and stuff, take it away from the CD-ROM. So anyway, this solved all of that. But it was super hard to convince anyone. And so, you know, hopefully your takeaway from being at spec is we love, I love to build things. Like oh, yeah. you can you can say oh well we should do X Y and Z and people are like eh. if if you can draw X Y and Z people will go oh well, that's kind of interesting if you can build X Y and Z people are like oh my god this is the best thing since sliced bread um, and so we couldn't build you know we couldn't build this laptop architecture it was just too expensive 
Um, and so we went from that, we kind of got rejected. Um, um, and we, we did some other stuff. We were doing uh, an architecture for sensing things in PDAs because PDAs were there. It wasn't phones. So we were, we were looking at like a, an interface for PDAs, which you could pan and zoom based on having, uh, this was revolutionary at the time, but having sensors in there, <laughs> you know, like, like phones have now. Yeah. Um, but again, it was like this big behemoth thing we were trying to do. And so uh, we brought in a business guy and for 18 months we had this architecture we built, you know, with a bunch of external things on a PDA that would, you could zoom in and out and on this demo and do things like this. And he eventually said, oh, I just think it's really hard for you guys to get anyone to say yes to this. And so we end, but I heard somebody made a bunch of money making cases. <laughs> <laughs> and so we pivoted to making something small that we could do ourselves, that we could pr prototype, that we could actually tool and produce without involving anyone else's cash. And, um, and as they say, the rest is history. We were, you know, we got, we were lucky we were in the right place at the right time. Um, but that's my takeaway is that, uh, bite off things that you can digest and kind of regurgitate in a way that people get excited about. Mm -hmm. uh, so especially with students, when you do a big project where it's not very tangible what you're doing, it's really hard to, I think it's really, it's a really hard project to do. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a really hard project to grade. And I think it's a really hard project for employers to kind of go and say, oh, that's interesting. Um, whereas when you have something which is small, smaller, which is you have expressed through drawings and models and, and prototypes and things like that, people just get interested, whether it's, you know, <laughs> just random stuff. You know, I mean, it could be nothing to do with their industry, but it's just interesting because it's tangible. Mm. And so getting tangible as much as possible is, is a key. And so that's why I, since then I've gone towards much smaller projects because we typically, I typically self fund them. Um, mm. and so the smaller, the better. Anyway. Yeah. I feel like I'm just babbling on, but no, no, it's, it's that there was just quite a few things that I was, uh, you know, thinking about and, and, and certainly I, I thought it was probably fair to mention, you mentioned about sort of being able to sort of quickly realize something in a prototype and not having to like exhaust huge amounts of money on something that's just too complex. Um, a lot of the discussions I've had with uh, students at university have been around the sort of value of quick prototyping and how it doesn't always have to be CAD models and 3D prints. Mm. Um, but I I wondered a little bit, you know, you've, you've honestly been there back in the day and i should say i still actually this is gonna sound very geeky but um at spec i that was the first thing i ever 3d printed and i've still mm. got a copy of the part which i've kept in a little shoebox so i mean for me it it really was I, I stayed in with a beer and another guy and we just watched a 3d printer for like a couple of hours and that seems unthinkably dull it's probably to this generation but at the time it was literally Magical. You know, I, I, I didn't even know anyone who had access to a 3D printer at that time. So I guess, um, and I guess maybe to tack on another little metaphor or anecdote, I remember uh, a, a friend of mine in, in, in Norway said, of course, everyone always thinks, you know, da Vinci is very romantic and sort of wood and belts and all this sort of stuff. But if he was alive today, he would be playing with you know, VR and AR and 3D printing and all this sort of stuff. He would use whatever it is. And I felt in quite a humble way that that actually that was the ethos that was completely alive at spec. Um, and, and it's clearly a bit of a red thread if I've just spoken to one of your uh, employees. And so I wondered whether to bring this back to a tangible question, what is the sort of inalienable truth that is around curiosity and playing with new technology to make sense of it? Um, play is the best thing you could ever do. Uh, and so playing, you know, there's, there's a sense of, well, there's that whole being in flow. And so you're not really, it's not work. You're just kind of like, oh, I just enjoy this. I get lost in this. 
and you end up places, play takes you places where you'd never have got to if you said, oh, I've got to, you know, do, 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 do. And so um, that's, again, if I relate it back to the size of a project, when you can create something tangible, whether it's foam core, paper, a, a print, um, it's just, I worked for uh, um, Denny Boyle at IDEO. Yeah. And he, he was famous. Uh, he had the relationship with Apple. And so I spent, um, I did a bunch of uh, projects for Apple. And uh, he was famous for going down to these Apple meetings. And we'd have sketches and presentations, but he was famous for bringing stuff. And so um, essentially we would go brainstorm, sketch, but then immediately go and build stuff. And in these crazy timelines, we would build, you know, foam core things, plastic spring hinges, you know, name it, typically <laughs> mechanical issues. And we'd be at these meetings and he would, he would always kind of pull out something towards the end <laughs> of the meeting. So he was famous for always kind of bringing out the prototype. And these prototypes always kind of took whatever direction the meeting people thought it was going and <laughs> took it somewhere else. Oh, wow. Okay. Because um, they, they answered a whole bunch of questions and they make it real. And so when you're playing and, and kind of creating stuff which is tangible, it's that, you know, is a picture worth a thousand words? Yes. Is a prototype worth a thousand pictures? Yes. And so that sense of building something that you can place in front of people is is the most important thing. So yeah, I've I've literally used that quote. I don't know who I wish I could uh, give credit, but I think that's yeah. like one of the best quotes out there for models. I, the vast majority of humankind can't take the leap from a sketch to a 3D thing. They don't have an opinion about it. They don't really know. They can't tell. Um, but you create something in 3D and every single human on the planet has an opinion. Mm. Good and bad. But they'll have an opinion. They can react to it. They, they think, you know, it's, it goes from being nothing to something which is really real. And so, you know, the, the downside is that they think it's really real where it's just, you know, very early, <laughs> like, thing... But it's huge. I mean, it makes a difference. Like you're sitting in a boardroom and there's 10 people around there and all of them, none of them are designers except you. And they just, they don't relate to, they think they're getting it, but you put a 3D thing on the table and every single person around that table goes, oh, well, if only it did this and this. And, and, and so you have this such much more productive conversation. Um, and so back to the playing thing, that's why I think it's hard as a student if it's non-tangible stuff that you're working on. Mm -hmm. If it's big, I mean, even interfaces and things like that, I mean, you can do them now um, much more easily. But, you know, if, if on the product side, if you can't, like, show something tangible, I think you just lose a lot of feedback from people. Mm -hmm. And you don't get nearly as far as you could have if you being able to, you know, in your project, build stuff. And it doesn't need to be the whole thing. It could be little bits of it. Um, I mean, the unfortunate thing nowadays is that I can buy a 3D printer on Amazon for $275, which prints better than anything I've ever printed before. It just sits, you know, right there and, and it prints. And so people are kind of in CAD. Mm which is a downside. I don't think people should be in CAD. And they're printing stuff. Whereas printing should really be kind of towards the end. Mm. Like, can you foam core it? Can you paper it? Can you 2D cut it and fold things up? Because that's all about the speed of it. Whereas if you're 3D printing, it's like, you're really down a path of, you think you know where you're going. And so, you know, the play thing is like, okay, well, let's do it. Let's do it quickly. Let's have lots of different ways we could do it. And which ones kind of has the most energy. And so when you do a 3D thing and you print it, it feels 
especially for students, it feels like a little bit of a dead end. Like, yes, you'll refine that, but you're going to just refine that. You're not going to kind of open up the playing field. And so I, I worry a little bit about how easy it is to print now. Just when I was a lad. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, I, as you were saying that, I, I'm acutely aware of how much uh, I, I basically second that opinion. Um, but I guess I'm trying to sort of desperately uh, put myself in the opposite to play devil's advocate. And I, I wonder, um, there's something my wife said to me of that uh, I've always been someone who sort of buys tools when I think I'm worthy of owning that tool. So I sort of, you know, I, I only recently sort of bought a little bandsaw because I'm like, yeah, I can honestly say that I'm going to use it enough on projects that means that I more than 10 times recoup the investment. And when I said, she said, yeah, she said, I get it. You're being responsible with our cash, which is good. I love you for that. But sometimes do you not feel certain tools you need to buy in order to play with, in order to understand what the potential might be? And I, I'm trying to wonder whether some students maybe listening to that comment about 3D printers would say, yeah, but my physical modeling skills are so terrible that I would never even become a designer if it wasn't for 3D printers. At least that way I can work in 3D CAD and then put it out to the world. And it, maybe it doesn't matter that I haven't had a sort of tacit appreciation for materials along the way. So I just, I wonder what's your uh, it's It's reaction? a tool like, it, well, <laughs> um, it's a tool like anything. And so it's useful when it can speed up your process. Yeah. And so if it speeds up your process, that's, it's fantastic. Anything that will speed up your process. So a prototype should do what? It should answer the question that you're asking. Mm -hmm. And so is the question you're ans asking, I want this you know, fully developed 3D form, which is you know, close to this file. Or is it, hey, what do I, how do I do this thing over in this tiny little section of what I'm trying to do? If you just print that and it answers your question, which you couldn't have answered in any other way, then it's a fantastic use of a 3D printer. And the fact that you have it is just a blessing, right? Yeah. But it should just be seen as a tool in your toolbox, not the thing that you would always want to go to. So it's that, that sense of, okay, well, I've got drawing, I've got sketching, I've got foam core, I've got plasticine, I've got woodwork, I've got a bandsaw. Like, which one of these tools is going to answer my question quicker? And obviously that's hard when you're starting out, you know, because you, 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 know, you, really, you don't know how long it takes to do stuff. Um, but just getting a sense of, like, how can I quickly answer the question that's most burning on my project and what tool should I use to answer it? And whether it's just going and talking to people could be, you know, that tool of, oh, have you done this before? Da, 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 da. Um, but, you know, the foam core, like doing mechanical stuff and uh, mechanisms and things like that. 3D printing is awesome, but I would typically do anything like that to 2D. I mean, yep. even if I had a, a 3D printer, I'm just going to print it in 2D because... Uh, you want to be able to separate your mechanism into a, a 2D thing because it's kind of hard to think in 3D. And so typically you'd be thinking about a 2D thing. So that's why uh, uh, blazer cutters are really cool because they're mm. super fast and you can get you know pretty accurate uh, with that. Whereas a 3D printer, um, you know, it's presumably you're, you're trying to answer a 3D question. Um, but they're fantastic. <laughs> Don't get yeah. me wrong. <laughs> And, and I realize I'm playing devil, devil's advocate when I'm already a yeah, little no, bit converted. Um, but, but I guess it's, it's, it's interesting, your point that uh, you, you make about uh, speed. And I, I've often felt that, you know, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't type very fast when I started using a computer. And I realized I forced myself to get better because I wanted to be able to type as fast as I could think. And I think that for me feels a little bit the same with prototyping. I, I use the fastest medium possible because otherwise I feel I'm losing, I'm losing stuff you know, if it doesn't keep up. If I spend 10 hours in CAD trying to make a widget when really on the first hour I had this incredible idea, then I feel like it, 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 it's, it's evaporating within yeah. seconds almost sometimes. Um, 
So I guess I think about that as craft. Yeah. Right. So I like woodwork, but woodwork is very much about the craft. Whereas I'm not, uh, you know, I know myself, I'm not a crafter. And yeah. so I get very frustrated when it's all about the, the fit and the finish rather than the answering the question. Yes. Um, and so I'm, I consider myself pretty much a hack in, in the, the shop because I'm going to kind of hack what I have because I just quickly want to answer the question <laughs> rather than make it beautiful. So I think I think I think uh, we might be converging on the same next point, which I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on. Is it's about questions? So how do you know when you're onto a good question? What is it that you've learned about the process to go? This isn't just a curiosity. I'm onto something. This is a rabbit hole worth going down. Um, that's a great. That's a great question. <laughs> I don't know. I can answer it. Um... But questions drive everything. I mean, questions, I mean, a a good designer typically comes in and all they do is ask questions. Why, 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 why? And you go into any company and at some point they're going to be, they'll hate you. (laughs) But they'll be also like, oh, well, I don't really know why we do it that way. We just have always done it that way. And that's kind of how the world is. Like, why do we have that gauge Railway, well, if that's the gauge. Okay, well, why? And you go back and, you know, presumably, you know, the, the, the story is based on the wagon wheel ruts, which were based on, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, but asking those questions, how do you know what's a great question? Um, I mean, it's really just what, you've, what, what is blocking your forward momentum. And so trying to identify the question that bests unblocks you is is um i mean it's obviously a a, a skill just like modeling mm. or you know it's something where kind of getting to the question so for me i like to approach things kind of more from an engineering perspective and so there's a lot of categorization mm. so in my project i like to categorize things well why are we doing it this way well that's because you know I'm trying to think of a good example, but um, can't on the spur of the moment. <clears throat> but I like to, to kind of think about, okay, what's the product doing? Well, it's doing this, 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 and this. And kind of trying to put those in categories and then trying to understand, well, what is it actually really doing and why? Mm. And then that's where observation comes in is you, you, you have a question and you think you have an answer to it, but then you'll, you'll have observations of people actually using product and you'll go, oh, well, they're not, they're not using it how I thought they would use it. And they're not thinking about it how I thought I'd use it. So how are they? You know, mm-hmm. What's their answer to the question that I'm asking? And so um, you know, that's just trying to understand. Like, I'm trying to think of an, a good example. So I, I think about um, uh, in the gaming world, Nintendo. Mm-hmm. So I, I think of them as a, as a classic company that th- just asked a different question. So you've got Microsoft, you've got, you've got Sony, and they're both going down the path of faster, bigger, better, graphics, graphics, graphics. Yep. Um, and then Nintendo couldn't compete with those, the, you know, the, the money in the, with those two companies. And so they just asked different questions. Well, why do people game? And how do people game? Mm. And what, what segment of gaming isn't being addressed? And that's, you know, so that where they came up with an underpowered um, console, which families loved. And so, you know, you've got your Xbox, you've got your PlayStation, and then you had your Nintendo Wii, which was this underpowered thing, which had this kind of weird interaction with it. And it wasn't very accurate, and the graphics were pretty poor, but... They had gone and talked to people and observed how they played and they'd said, well, we really want to involve the family. And so they brought people off of just a single player in the dark, like shooting mm. things and got whole families playing together and doing bowling and, and just kind of goofy, fun stuff. And so um, just, I think, from asking different questions. I, I think I, I love the fact that you're uh, 
picking up on Nintendo. And of course, it's it's timely with Lego having just released an amazing project with uh, a Mario interaction game. But oh, aside from that plug uh, to Jonathan, high five on that one. Um, I think I think there's something I remember hearing an anecdote about Nintendo, which which I really love that a lot of their success of, of a couple of their lead designers, I forgive the name, I uh, forget the name rather, but they said that the actual little screens, you know, those ones which basically are sort of segmented and it's already printed on. And so the electricity lights up one feature. It's not like a pixelized display. So mm-hmm. that was even before the Game Boy. They got really excited about that because it was incredibly cheap to produce. And so you could put games in like rulers, you could put them mm. in on, on all sorts of things. And it was... And, and and I thought there was actually quite some courage of this lead, very senior designer saying, I don't actually always chase the cutting edge technology. I chase the overlooked old technology. And Which then expensive. reimagine it. Because yeah, he realizes that also there's there's two interesting points. Is one, it's already been de-risked, which I'm sure we all know having worked in in uh <laughs> You know, companies is it's one thing to say you got the new cool thing, but no one likes to pay for it because there are no economies of scale. But the other thing that he said is that a lot of people will come along and, you know, make it color screen or all this lot. And when they did, he just said, I'm not worried at all because they're never going to make the margin that we are. We're absolutely killing it. The gameplay is what people are drawn to. And it's to your mm-hmm. point is that it. Nintendo realized that people, and I think this is very true of sort of hits like Candy Crush, is that it's that people wanted to spend time being entertained in a place that's usually in transit, you know, waiting for a bus or going home in a taxi, whatever it is. And so I'm coming full circle to my question, forgive me, but it's a little bit, uh, if, if it doesn't feel like the same thing, of that when I think about what's really hard when you're back in the student days, it's it's finding a project that you really get excited about. And part of it is finding that good question, but part of it is also finding a genuine need. I mean, often the biggest mm-hmm. insult you can give a designer is that's a solution looking for a problem, you know, and, and it, it implies well, you have so that You can say that for, for companies, billion-dollar yeah. companies. I mean, um, technology, is, which is looking for a solution, that's that's pretty much... I don't know, 90% of new products out there are, are technology-driven. Yeah. They're not really... They're, it's not about what people are really looking for. It's just like, well, it's faster. It's, you know, it does X, Y, and Z. Like, if you think about your television... Yeah. I mean, television prices kind of... After are, a certain point. <laughs> they just, they're still ways... Well, they're, they're exactly. Yeah. And they've got internet and they've got all of this other stuff. And you can talk to them like... I've never used 95% of what's on my TV. No. I just don't need it. And the only reason it's in there is because you get to charge more. And so, um, yeah, that whole technology looking for solution is, uh, oh, that just drives me insane. <laughs> so, so I guess maybe um, one of the things I know that we wanted to talk about a little bit, so forgive me for just a terrible segue into it, was you you mentioned a lot of your 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 past the reason you became an you know entrepreneur um is ultimately you said it it wasn't out of some headstrong charging off into the distance it was that you felt you were somewhat you know pretty unemployable i believe were your words <laughs> and so i i wondered could you sort of you know deconstruct that a little bit of 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 why you felt that way yeah, it's, I mean, I've started a number of companies, probably 10, 15, maybe 20. Um, some crash and burn, some done very well. Um, and as what I said, I think I said to you was my, my mother was just like, I never thought you'd, I never, like, you as a business person? <laughs> um, so it was never anything that I th- thought that I would do. Um, and... You know, so I did the design thing, I did the engineering, did the design thing, started a design consultancy, which didn't really feel like start to, feel like starting a company. That's more like um, kind of doing more of what I was doing, but having more say in how to do it. Um, but then those first four or five years of 
doing that, it's like, oh, holy crap. Like being a business person or having a company, you have to think about all this other stuff. Marketing operations, finance, da, da, da. Um, and so that kind of goes by in a blur. And then I, you know, I started, we started a couple of other companies and, you know, I realized, oh, I really enjoy the kind of the starting stuff. And then at some point I'm like, oh, well, what if I want to go get a job? And I started looking at the jobs out there and I'm like, oh, hmm, I'm kind of this weird peg that's never going to be fit into a, to the corporate, you know, round hole. Um, and so I don't know if that answers your question, but it at some point it was definitely like, oh, I'm pretty unemployable. And I, I guess a little bit of that, it's 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 sort of for me, it it resonates with this sense of, um, you know, if you if you if you found your vocation very early on in life, and you think I want to become a a particular type of doctor, sure, go do the training, run at it. Yeah. But but it feels like in many ways you've managed to make a career out of multiple different careers that were very diverse. Like no no two of your businesses you'd say look the same. They all have you know, very different journeys, very different products, and I'm sure very different teams that you brought together. Um, and I wonder how much, I, I realise there's a temptation for me to sort of sell it as, because it's clearly the uh, the story that I'm trying to weave for myself, but, but do you think there's a genuine case to say that as the world becomes more connected, the specialist is of course needed, but the, to use the old phrase of a T-shaped, you know, identity, do you, do you think that is going to become more of a necessity um, for future generations? Um, good question. Do, I, I'm not, yeah. So I guess I, to sharpen the question, do you think we will get more T-shaped out of necessity or is that just flattery for creative people? <laughs> is it flattery for creative people? Um <laughs> I mean, I hope that everyone knows what a T-shaped... Maybe, kind of... maybe take it from the top. Yes, apologies. <laughs> um, so I think it's an uh, ideal-coined description. And so the idea being uh, uh, knowing a lot about... Knowing a little about a lot of things is that sense of having a broad kind of knowledge, but not much depth. And then the, the vertical in the T would be... Um, so that's good. Being a generalist is good. But it's even better when you have a depth of knowledge in some area. Um, and so I, I very much subscribe to that because I find people are most interesting, creative, who, who kind of dabble in many, many things, but also bring something to the table which is unique and different and like you would never have expected. And so we talked a lot about this uh, prior to, to our call. Um, it's like having that passion. And what do we call oh, We talked about um, raising racing pigeons for some reason. <laughs> Just yeah. randomly raising racing pigeons. And so, <clears throat> oh, I think it was in the context of what would I look for in a student coming out of college? Yes. And you were definitely looking for the passion. Yeah. Looking for the passion. But what do I mean by passion? Mm. And so... When you come out of college, you don't know, you don't know nothing. Um, you have a smattering of a whole bunch of things. You've probably had a couple of classes about finance. You've had a couple of classes about thermodynamics. You've had a couple of classes about mass. You've had a couple of classes about project. You know, it's like, how could you know anything in depth about those? And so where the T comes in is, well, presumably you, you feel really strongly about something. Um, and so... To bring it back to racing pigeons, like if you if you were just really into racing pigeons, there's a whole bunch of stuff to kind of crack open there. There's okay, there's the housing of them, the feeding of them. Like so, how do you design the best cage? Uh, there's the transportation of them. There's the tracking of them. So there's RF. There's a whole bunch of RF stuff where you know you never want to lose a pigeon. How do you get it as small as possible? And so you, know, you think about just that one little thing. That one little passion mm. has all of this stuff, which is really, really interesting, which you would probably get into some depth about just by having, you know, the interest in that area. And so 
having stuff like that helps you in in all of this broad stuff because you know you can go deep and you can know you can find out stuff and, and kind of get into the nitty gritty because the the tea is really about the nitty gritty mm. um and so plus also having that depth is like you can say oh well over here you know i was da 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 whatever it might be but i can bring that up onto this top level and kind of have it not just be a superficial ad. It's like, okay, well, I really think this is this is an important part of this project. Um, so when I'm talking to students, it's really about, okay, well, you know, you've got a good education, you've done some nice projects, but what are you really, what are you into and mm-hmm. why? And, um, you know, how have you followed up in it? Uh, were we talking? I mean, it's it, with students, it's really about, like, how have you shown like just taking that extra extra mile mm. because it's super hard to just go off of your projects because the projects they're they're super short you know two or three months at their maximum typically um and so it's hard to get into any depth on, on, a, on a student project unless you kind of say okay well i'm going to fo- keep following up in it and um you know it doesn't need to be a lot. It's just like, okay, well, I, I did this, I, I trademarked it, or I talked to these these other manufacturers, I explored this, I realized I couldn't do that. You know, it's just like, how how can you, you know, show me that you've got this kind of sense of perseverance mm. of like really following a project and kind of having some passion around it. So that's kind of what I would look for for, for students is like that sense of, they're bringing something else and it doesn't need, it could be racing pigeons. Uh, it doesn't need to be design. Um, yeah. yeah, I guess I'm just thinking a little bit about, you know, what, what, what you're saying about that thing of time and having something really span over longer than the course of a, of a single project. Um, I think that can be really, really valuable. As certainly, as soon as you get out there into the world, you happily work on projects which run sometimes on the background as well for a long time and then pick up as I'm sure you've, you've done yourself with, with multiple companies you've mentioned, you've had them ticking away. Yeah. I mean, um, you're working on an idea and it's just an idea and you sketch it now and then and you forget about it. And then you're like, Oh wait, I was, yeah, I was working on that. So go back and get your sketchbooks and like, Oh, how can I move this forward now? So, so you, I guess you come at things with a different perspective because time gives you perspective, right? Mm. I mean, time is a heat, like, one of the underrated um, factors for how you uh, can judge a project, like just give some more time and you'll have a completely v- different viewpoint in that project. Like uh, you'll look back in a project from last year and you'll be like, oh, well, why, why were we doing that? <laughs> and the only reason you're there is because of the time that's passed. And so it adds, a, it does add a lot, kind of giving you some distance from, from what you were working on. So, so I guess that's that's kind of where I was wanting to go. Is just thinking of putting myself back into the sh- student's shoes. Of of you've got to, you, You've got to go for education system, or at least if you elected to go for it, you have. Um, but but in some ways, how do you? Forgive me for. I'll reframe the question. I guess one of the realizations I had at university was that I realized. You know, the first year my tutors were there to basically hold my hands. The second year they were able to rattle my cage. And then by the third, fourth year, whatever, um, I was ultimately having to set the bar for myself. Mm -hmm. You know, I wasn't looking to them to say, is this good enough? I had to look to myself to say, do I think it's good enough based on whatever criteria I'm setting? I I guess the question that I'm kind of curious to know is you're doing that a lot when you're running a startup. You're always... You know, I mean, yes, you've got finances. Yes, you've got legal, all those things. But ultimately, you're making a call on what you think is the right thing. Yeah. Other than and just whether the, the... And whether the product will actually... Who cares or who will care about it? So, yeah, I guess what I'm, what I'm wanting to ask is what voices should students start to try and go seek out more of so that they can develop that muscle of self-critique? Well, I think the... the 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 one who's going to crit- critique you most is yourself. Like having self doubt, this is a terrible product. No one's interested in it. I mean, it's just super hard. I, I mean, I 
suffer from it still. It's like, okay, well, no, you know, I, I think it's interesting, but, you know, no one else does. <laughs> Um, or it's, you know, it's just a super small market or whatever, whatever it might. So I don't know that there's people you go to talk to about that, but there's yourself. You shouldn't listen to sometimes because you're going to be like, oh, this doesn't make sense. I shouldn't do this. I should go do something else. Um, and so it's the ability to be able to set something down, but not say I'm done with this. Just to be able to set something down and say, okay, I'm not really thinking straight about this right now. You know, give me a week, give me an overnight. Let me go talk to somebody. I mean, I can't tell you how many people have come through the doors of my design consultancy. I call them the mad inventors. <laughs> they'll come in and they'll be like, I've got this crazy idea. It's a really good one. And then they'll share it after, you know, I've given them an NDA, da, 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 da. And it's a really poor idea. Mm. Or it's already out there. They just doesn't, haven't done enough, like, looking around. And invariably, it would have been improved if they'd talked to people. And so there's a sense of... And obviously it's a balance. There's this sense of, I've got this really interesting thing. I'm scared to share it with anyone because they'll steal it. Mm. Whereas my perspective is most humans in the planet will do nothing with your <laughs> like billion dollar idea. Yep. Number one is they don't think it's a billion dollar idea. Number two is it's hard to do stuff with a billion dollar idea. And number three, they just don't get it. Um, and so, but they will have a perspective on it. And so they can give you feedback. Oh, well, you know, have you thought about that? And you're like, well, actually, I actually have not thought about that. And you can write it down. You can go away and think about it. And so really getting imp input on whatever you're doing can never be overemphasized as a good thing. Mm. Um, obviously, you know, there's there's some situations where you want to protect yourself, whether it's through patenting, NDAs, and stuff like that. But those are always hard to to see the value of sometimes. Whether people actually ever kind of do abide by those NDAs and and patents. I mean, if a patents essentially, I do patents, but they're really worthless. Um, <laughs> they're only they're only useful if there's a lot of money involved mm. and it's where you can have a patent attorney defend you on commission, um, that kind of thing. Um, whereas typically, you know, as a small entity, if a big company comes along and says, boo, you're just going to go, oh, okay, <laughs> there's not much you can do, <laughs> even if you have the patent, because <clears throat> it costs money to defend that patent. But back to your, back to your thing, it's so talking to as many people as possible, from all walks of life. And so people really hate to show their idea to potential users. Mm. I, I mean, I still hate it because they're going to shoot you down. They're going to say, oh, well, this, you know, it's not as good as that thing. You know, uh, and so it's really, really hard to feel that criticism or hear that criticism. And so most people, myself included, avoid it for too long, <laughs> whereas yeah. The whole process would be sped up if you had just had the, you know, the uh, bravery potentially to just go and ask people about what you're working on. And so holding it too close to your chest is a really bad thing. Um, and going and talking to users is a, both a painful thing, but also speeds up the process so much. Mm. And, I, and yeah. I'm sure there's so many industries that, you know, what you've just said, they can relate to. I mean musicians certainly come to mind you know at what point do you put it out there and you know it's just you know critics can be savage you know the public can be savage and yet and they can be savage even about the most avant-garde like <laughs> thing that people will look like all of the painters who are all dead and they're they're painting sell for millions of dollars they were like poo-pooed at the time yeah and so it's hard to be kind of on the the bleeding edge right and to hold to your vision Mm. Or at least, you know, not get totally knocked down off your 
of where you think you're headed. Um, but this, back to the mad inventor thing, like they are mad inventors because they haven't talked to anyone. Mm. And they'll come in and they'll talk about their invention and they're like, okay, well, there's something interesting there, but this, this, and this exist. And they kind of do 90% of what you're trying to do here. So where's the value that you're adding? And so just having those mm. conversations with people that are in the industry or are doing something uh, close to what you're trying to do is super, mm. super helpful. I mean, I always find the uh, the stories of Edison and Tesla very cautionary, that everyone acknowledges that Tesla, I mean, you can put a question mark on the mad, but most certainly a genius, but really did the whole secret squirrel, didn't want to talk to anyone about it. Whereas Edison, you know, just blundered through a lot of prototypes, but ultimately got the answers, got the feedback, somehow had developed a thick enough skin that he would continue with some ideas against better advice <laughs> and, uh, but, but again, it, it's, it's, uh, I guess well, I mean, you said I'm sure it, you've, you've, you, uh, I'm sure you must subscribe to quality over quantity, quantity no. over quality. Sorry. No, have to. Is that, is that a podcast or a newsletter? No, no. I'm just saying that. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I was like, that sounds like a great podcast. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? <laughs> but it's the classic, I, I'm a yep. huge believer in the quantity over quality. Yeah. Um, and so you look at Edison and yeah, he's remembered for the, the high points, but the, he's remembered for the, these high points because he had all these like huge amount of low points. Like the base was this so wide <laughs> and it comes up to here. Whereas if, if your base is this wide, you only come up to here. So it's, 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 uh, I, I was reading about Newton and mm -hmm. he was into, I don't know, there was two other realms that he was really into. He was into the physics, but he was also into like astrology and something else, like <laughs> out there, crazy things. Um, but we only really remember him for being a genius about physics. Who cares about the rest, right? Yeah. And, and so, um, you know, putting yourself out there is, is important and hard. So I guess maybe a good follow on and, and maybe a sort of, I'm just conscious of time, uh, but maybe a good sort of closing question is just, um, I remember you saying that you uh, studied naval architecture and then it didn't work out for you. And I think, you know, myself, I studied a chemistry degree and it was a pivot. And what I realized is that ultimately it, it's not necessarily the mistake that's the problem. It's whether you carry that burden as a negative or whether you learn to reframe the story in a way that is not just interesting for other people, but also uh, either nourishing or at least just not negative for yourself. And mm -hmm. so it strikes me as someone who has, and I say this obviously in the in the right capacity, made a hell of a lot of mistakes. You're obviously still incredibly passionate and in the industry and loving it. So I just wonder what advice would you give to students maybe as a uh, a closing thought of how they continue against adversity, um, not just of the current situation, but there's always going to be days of setbacks. Yeah, Um I'm much more interested in people who've crashed and burned than people who haven't tried. Um, they'll just have learned more. They'll have taken their licks. I mean, all, it's... So you, you mentioned the naval architecture. I mean, I did naval architecture down in uh, University College in London for uh, three years. And it's a three-year course. And so I burned, crashed and burned in the final year. I essentially got eight and a half credits and you need nine to, to graduate with like an ordinary degree or something like that. And so I hated it, kept going for stupid reasons uh, and crashed and burned. And then uh, I went off and took a year off and did a whole bunch of fun stuff. <clears throat> I came back and was trying to figure out what, what I wanted to do and um, found the PDE course. I think it was my dad's like, okay, well, that looks interesting. You kind of have to build stuff and things like that. So um, it was a revelation because in the naval architecture, it was all just regurgitating somebody else's theories. Mm -hmm. Whereas the design, um, it was like, okay, well, here's a blank page. What are you going to do? Um, and so back <laughs> to your back back to your question, um, I I really think that just getting out there is the hardest part. And so having like having the chutzpah to get out there and fail 
you will have learned more. And so, that, like, I mean, I'm it still... I still feel exactly the same way as like, oh gosh, I'm really worried about what people are going to think about when I, if I put out this product. Um, which is, it's just crazy. It's just human, right? And so what if I fail? Are they, is everyone, you know, so like it never goes away. Ever. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't, I'm sure um, Mr. Mr. Um, Elon Musk feels the same way, like, okay, if I do this, what are people going to say? Um, and so that never goes away. So you just have to do it and then live with the consequences. And it's what you do with the consequences, which is the interesting part. Mm. Um, so if you, yeah, if you do a project as a student and, and you try and f follow it through, like just the fact that you've tried to follow it through and all the steps that you've done and you know maybe you've absolutely crashed and burned for s silly reasons but you have learned a whole bunch of stuff along the way that if you had never taken that project forward you wouldn't and so it's for me it's lifelong learning it's putting things out there when it's you know because there's 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 a bias not to do that there's just a bias to inaction for most people so it's it's always good to have a bias to action. It's like, okay, I'm going to build something. I'm going to draw something. I'm going to model something. I'm going to go up and talk to someone about this thing. Those are all active things, which is hard for most people to do. It's much easier just to just sit and have, drink a pint and, you know, think about all the things you wish were happening with your project. Um, and so, you know, making, failing is, I think... You know, failure used to be this terrible thing, especially in Britain. So the wonderful thing about the U.S. is that historically they've had a much um, healthier relationship with failure. You know, failure is just, it isn't seen as this life career ending thing. It was just like, oh, they, they messed up. What are they going to do next kind of thing? And so um, I think it's much more that way over here now. That failure isn't like a career ending thing. It's just mm. like if you don't fail, it means you have, you're not like trying. Like it's it's by you know, it's the whole conservative you have if you if you if your project doesn't fail, if you don't if like you want to be pushing too far to somebody says, Whoa, 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 you know, that you're really off the deep end here. But okay, good. We found where the edge is. Um and so Without the failure, you know, you, you're just playing it too safe. And so when, on developing products, you want to like, kind of push it to the edge and then a little bit further and then say, OK, well, yeah, I think, I, I, you know, you found where the edge is. And so it's just finding that edge of what, you know, where things stop from going from interest to being like oh, terrible. <laughs> I think that's just really important to find. And as a student, it's harder to do that. And so kind of taking it a little bit further than your project would at school helps you kind of, it just helps. I think it's just mm -hmm. a very powerful thing. It's just hard to do. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't know if that's helpful, but. Um, no, I, I think it is. And I think, I think it's just helpful sometimes to, to frame things that, you know, let's, let's be it as someone who is, you know, a, an employer of young talent. Um, you're not saying that and not walking the talk. You're someone who is embracing the 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 whole package of someone at the beginning of their journeys. Um, I, I certainly feel having moved from being employed and managed by a manager to being a manager that I, I, I very much always feel that one of the things sometimes students do overlook is that um, because of that rawness, because of that naivety, it's actually quite fun as a manager to manage that because you get surprised by what they come up with. Yeah, as long as you've yeah. made them feel comfortable in that space to feel that failure, you know, shouldn't just be dismissed. If you, I mean, I remember the, you know, accidentally breaking a 15,000 pound prototype at Dyson. I was mortified, but you know, it was an honest mistake. And then there's other mistakes that you make, which are, are really silly. And you think I, I really shouldn't do that again. Mm. But, but I feel an environment which is, uh, conducive to sort of the, as you said, the lifelong learning. I I hope that's the message, and I think you've communicated that in a lot of different ways uh, over the past conversation. So, 
Mm. Thank you so much, David. It's uh, Thank you. been a Thanks, real pleasure. Uh, uh, it's been a pleasure for me. I mean, <laughs> I always enjoy talking about this kind of stuff. And um, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, I look forward to seeing what comes out next with the headphones. And uh, Yes. Look forward. We'll, <laughs> I'm looking we'll, forward to just shipping them. Exactly. I'll definitely update it and put a link in the below. So, uh, okay. Sounds good. Again. Thanks, Jude. Take care. See you. Bye.